you want to open your Bibles to Matthew 23, you can. We've been in this chapter for, I think, three weeks. I, I did three different sermons on, on the Pharisees, and I'm calling the, the series Good News for Pharisees. And I think one of the reasons, going back to my interaction with Jill, I think one of the reasons she was a little uncomfortable about this is because we talked together uh, as I was letting her know what I was planning to do. And I said, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the Pharisees. And she said, boy, that seems almost to be a little bit of a depressing topic. And we've got, we've already had a lot on it. So should we kind of move along and, and not park there too, too long? Um, so let me, let me ask you, when you hear the term Pharisee, what do you think of? Self-righteousness, the first word that comes to mind for David. Hypocrites, thank you, Mike. Yeah, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I see some visitors this morning, but most of you who have been with us, um, you know that I have said before, my, my own experience in church land was interesting in that I went from a pretty typical secular family in America. I mean, we attended church on and off when I was a kid growing up and then did some when I was in high school, although for a couple of years I probably didn't go hardly at all. Um, so in that sphere, you know what that's like when you're trying to, in your high school, you're trying to figure out who you are and what you're good at and what you want to do for your career. And, you know, you're trying sports and you're trying different academic fields of study and you're just doing normal kid stuff, just messing around, having fun, wasting time, right? So there's a lot of that going on for me and trying to figure out where my niche was. I always wanted to excel, always wanted to be the best at something. I've always been a kind of a perfectionist, so very high standard for myself, and I still suffer from that, unfortunately. Uh, so I was kind of pursuing different things, and I, I tried the sports route, I tried the academic route, I even tried business, and I worked for a bank and took business classes at night and things like that. And I never found my niche. I never found where I could really shine the way I wanted to. I always found that I was sort of mediocre, average in those areas. Uh, but then age 19 or 20, uh, some things changed, and I started to kind of come under some conviction and feel the sense that I, I did want God in my life. I wanted to give the Bible a chance and start uh, reading it and see you know, if it would speak to me. And it did. Yeah, I started to enjoy delving into it and learning. And, and then not long after that, I, I moved away from home and moved to a Clearwater, Florida, where I attended a Christian college. And then I went from the Christian college four years there to four more years in seminary. It's where we met the Brewers. And it was, it was basically my opportunity to find a place where I fit. And I, I felt like I finally was shining somewhere. Like, I, this is where I could really excel. This is what I was good at. I felt like I had a certain ability in public speaking. And also, I've always been sort of a goody-goody. Even when I was doing rebellious things, people still treated me like a goody-goody. So, hey, might as well run with it. This seems to be my deal. So I'll go with that. And uh, I was good at it, man. I was really, I'm still good at it. And, and so I found, I thought, I found my niche. And, and then uh, years ago, 2010, 11, I... This is ad nauseum for some of you because I've mentioned it so many times. But it was, a, it was a, like a crisis of faith for me. Here at the church, things fell apart. My marriage was falling apart. Everything was just going haywire. And I started to realize, wow, um, a lot of what I have been dedicated to in my life, uh, a lot of what I was participating in and, and committed to and passionate about and excited about in the name of God wasn't really helping me face the reality of the ugliness of who I can be in my sin and, and how I can exalt myself and mistreat people. And in fact, it, I went from kind of one sphere of trying to be the best Jeff Pierce I could be. I went from that to a, just a different sphere in which I was trying to do the same thing, still trying to prove myself. And so, and the reason I say all that is because I think the Carnahan said they think of rule followers when they think of Pharisees. Do you understand, and, and, and again, depending on how much you've been with us in the series that I've been going through in Good News for Pharisees, I guess I'm wondering if you realize how subtle that temptation is to make church and religious things just a new sphere in which to try to prove ourselves and try to become something and to try to make ourselves right, try to make other people right, try to make our families right. 
and not in a healthy way, but in an unhealthy way because of what that will do for me. If I can have the certain maybe American dream with the white picket fence and the beautiful house and the obedient children and everything's kind of rosy, healthy, wealthy, and wise, then hey, look, great. And yet we can be, we can be entrenched in that type of thinking. We can be very busy in that type of lifestyle. And we can be missing completely the point of who Jesus is. We can be completely self-absorbed. We can be using other people. We can be imposing our own righteousness and our own standards on other people. And it's a miserable endeavor. It can be. Uh, does that make sense? Can any of you relate to that in any way? If you've been with us, maybe you remember the section in Matthew 23 verse, let's see, 5, 6, and 7. Let's read those verses where Jesus says, they, that is the Pharisees, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. They broaden their phylacteries, lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. When you hear that, do you hear men trying to prove themselves? Do you hear men trying to find an identity for themselves as they love the honor they receive at the banquets when they sit up front in the honored guest seats? They love to be called rabbi by people. They love that respect. Can you see how their religious involvement became a new sphere for them in which to prove themselves and become something? And can you see how there are similar ways in which we, we do the same thing? And maybe for you, again, I, I'm the only career minister guy in here, I think. Uh, so can you see how in, in other careers there can still be this drive to prove something, to make a name for myself, to establish my identity based upon what I'm able to achieve or how other people view me? How does that play out in a, in a secular sphere? Can anyone give me an example? Yeah. So we can relate to that in the sense of the, the negative that we've experienced maybe in our own lives or in an environment like that. And, and maybe we've seen some of the positive of when a team, what's an athletic team or a team in martial arts that people are focused on a common goal where there can be some good in, in letting go of this need to prove myself and, and kind of focusing on the group and not just the individual, not just myself. So we can see that even just from a normal human psychological perspective, right? That, that there's a greater degree of healthiness to that selfless approach rather than a self-absorbed approach. Uh, yeah, Mikkel? Any parents in here can relate to that? I mean, whether it's sports for your kid, the, the way they do and how they do in school, how popular they are in school, uh, depending on what your personal preferences are, there might be different things that are important to you, but... Boy, I mean, our kids reflect us, don't they, in a way. And so we want them to achieve because we want that to look good for us. Is that right? Or Yeah, real subtle. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. I mean, does God, it, maybe the implication of what we're saying here as we're talking about the Pharisees and I've said to you week after week after week in this section uh, hey, look, you're a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee. Just to, to read this section in Matthew 23 and say, well, that doesn't apply to me, or maybe it used to apply to me, but it doesn't apply to me anymore. Ironically, that's a Pharisaical way of interpreting this because that's what the Pharisees would say. When you look at Luke 18, the two men that come to the temple, they come to the religious place, the, the church of their day. They come to the temple to pray, and one of them is a Pharisee, and the other one is a tax collector. And if you remember the story, the tax collector beats on his chest. He, doesn't even, he won't even look up. He feels so unworthy to be there. And he says, God, be merciful to me, the, not just a sinner, but the sinner. <laughs> be merciful to me, the sinner. Here's a guy who says, God, I am my biggest problem. I'm disgusted with myself. And the implication of what he said was, God, I need mercy from you. I need you to cover me. I need you to help me. And Jesus says, that's the guy that goes away right Justified is the term he uses, the theological term. He is justified. He is declared right before God. That's what rightness looks like. The other guy goes to the same place 
the Pharisee and says, thank you, God. I mean, he even invokes the name of God. Thank you, God. I'm not like this jerk over here, and I, I give tithes, and I do this, and I do that, and all these things. I Look what I'm doing, God, because of my love for you and my desire to honor you. I'm doing all of this. And, and Jesus says, that guy was lost. So ironic. I mean, you gotta, I mean, if you're thinking carefully about that, it sounds weird. It's like saying it to a bunch of church people. What? What? I mean, did you not drive to church this morning and see a bunch of cars parked in people's driveways and knowing people are probably still sleeping? Maybe getting up for the 10 o'clock football game, but I mean, and Jesus says to church people, I mean, we're the ones that got our lazy butts out of bed this morning and got here and riled the kids and got them all here and, and went through the conflict resolution process on the way over here with our kids, right? You were, you were here first. Congratulations. Good illustrations. So, yeah, David. Yeah, the tie there. Look at, look at verse uh, 2. Chapter 23, verse 2. This is the first thing that Jesus has to say about them. The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. And you can just blow right by that, but that's really significant. That's the seat of authority. And, and who seated them there? Did God seat them there, or they seated themselves there? There's not one person in this room who doesn't sit in the seat of Moses on a regular basis. That elevated position and just judging. Whether that's judging the football coach of your favorite football team or judging what your kid should be thinking and doing. And we speak authoritatively. And let me ask you this question. As you think that way and believe in your mind that you see it all clearly and you know exactly what those people need to, be, to do and then you communicate that to them, let me ask you, how's that working for you? <laughs> how's that going? I mean, in one sense, in a, in, a, in, a, in a business world, for example, managers, they, they have to guide the team. They have to manage in that way. Um, and and it, things keep working. You know why things keep working? Because there's money involved. <laughs> That's the motivation. All right? You take money out of the picture and just have a family context or a church context. When you try to sit in that seat and just bark out orders, or, or send down your divine you know, decrees from your seat of authority, how's that going for you? It's a miserable place to be, isn't it? For one thing, people never cooperate the way you want them to. For another thing, you're constantly got this cycle in your head of this toxic thinking that's weighing you down. For another thing, it, it damages those relationships the people who you want most to listen to you are least likely to listen to you. The louder you speak, the more they cover their ears. The more you pursue them, the farther they run away from you. You've probably experienced that to one degree or another, right? Here's Jesus saying, look, th this is the human way of doing righteousness. That David Bragg said earlier, when you think of Pharisees, self-righteousness. The Luke 18 story says the man who was righteous was the guy who said, I don't do anything right. It's so ironic. In a way, it's, it's perplexing. I, um, y y those of you who are part of our church, I mean, you you've seen this evolution over the past few years. And I think Don would say the same thing. But we're, you're getting, when we teach you, when we share with you, I mean, it's like Paul said, I, I imparted to you not only the gospel, but also my own soul, right? So as you hear from us, you're hearing information coming through broken vessels, and you can't help but also hear some of our experience and some of our own personal thinking along with that. And I will admit to you that I'm still trying to figure out, I'm still trying to figure out the simplicity of following Jesus. And knowing, knowing the love of God. And knowing the love of God as an individual. And knowing the love of God with other, a group of other people in the community. I'm still trying to figure that out. I've got, guys, I've got deep-rooted disappointments with the church. Um, I'm going to give you an example. I, pardon me, I don't want to, but I'm going to. Uh, but first, let me show you this verse. Look at um, verse 8. Go to verse from verse 8 to verse 10. Do not be called rabbi. 
For one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. I don't know why, but I so badly want to believe that there's a man out there that I can look up to, that I can respect, that I can follow, that I can trust. I want, remember the Israelites, they said, we want a king like the other nations have. You know, the church land is like the same thing. We want a king. And so even as my perspective has changed and I've seen more through a through gospel-centered view of Scripture and I've been encouraged and built up in that, and so I've migrated kind of away from one set of religious leaders and teachers and authors to a new set of religious leaders, teachers, authors. And um, in recent news, for some, I don't know if you follow, some of you may have followed this to some degree, but some things have come out related to this Tully and Chavidjan guy that uh, I've recommended some of his books in the past. I've benefited from his books. I've benefited from some of his sermons that I've heard. Uh, I'm looking at Doug because Doug and I were just talking about this earlier. And Tracy, Doug's wife Tracy, has a little bit of a relationship with him. It's a long story, but via social media. And, and all this ugly, I mean, ugly stuff is coming out about this guy. And I'm like, here we go again. I mean, how many times have I done this? <laughs> <laughs> with when I was a kid looking up to Charles Stanley and then it was John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and Steve Lawson and then it was Tully and Chavidjan and Tim Keller and I mean whoever it is. And in some ways I want to say, what, is this all just a big sham? And I read words like that where Jesus said, look, I told you what you need to know. <laughs> I already told you, I didn't hide it from you. There's only one leader. Jesus says, it's me. Look, you might. this is a tiny church, okay? But I know the way people think. You may have a, a tendency to lift me up in your head or don up in your mind or have some view of who we are. And I'll tell you, like Paul said, we are, we are clay pots, Paul basically said. We're like these uh, Tupperware containers. <laughs> Tupperware is not super valuable in and of itself. But if you put gold inside of it, has value to offer you. Not inherent value, but the value of something, a treasure. And, and Paul says, uh, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. There's this message. There's this person. And he transcends all the broken, junky, fallen stuff down here. It's bigger, brighter, better. I think my goal, our goal as leaders here for years has been that that the people who attend here, the people who are plugged in here would come to know Christ in an individual way and in a, in a corporate way within the community with a very clear understanding of just how broken we all are and how great Christ is and how kind he is and how merciful he is and how involved he is. Um, and in light of that, I would say, please pray for Tully and Chavidjan and others like him who God, who God has allowed to have elevated platforms, large audiences, hundreds of, th I think he has like hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter and social media. I mean, these are influential people. I say, pray, pray for them. Broken, fallen people. Uh, this is so important. I, as we've looked at these characteristics for the last few weeks, I have seen myself, I I hope you've seen yourself, and again, if you're, if you're visiting this morning, the messages are online, and uh, Lord willing, next week we will be returning to normal messages, sermons, but uh, I did, I did want to just kind of talk with you about these things. Uh, anything that I've said stimulate your thinking in any other areas that you want to share or questions you want to ask? Actually, I thought of one other thing to say, but I'll let you, if anyone has anything. Yeah, back here. Yeah, it's good, and that actually fits perfect with what I thought I wanted to to say. The last the last thing I had to um, to get out, uh, which is some of what what I've said already, begs the question of well, does God want us to view ourselves as these worthless nobodies then? And there's should there be no sense of accomplishment? Should we have no goals in life? Should we all just sink into a beanbag chair and fade off into oblivion. I don't know, sometimes I want to do that, to be honest with you. But uh, I, uh, 
I don't believe that is Christ's point at all. I think the irony is, is that sometimes we, we trip over or choke on some of the things that he is saying to us because they do confront us with how messed up we are. And yet his motive is always our good and our liberation. And the Son of Man came to set the captives free, right? He comes to set us free. He comes to minister to us. In an ironic sense, Jesus is really fulfilling all of God's expectations for us that we might be freed from the burden of that. He fulfills the law for us that we might be freed from the burden of having to measure up. And the irony is, I believe the more we understand that, the more we're growing in that, we are liberated to, to be who God created us to be. Everyone in this room has unique skills and abilities, and everyone's wired differently. And, and, and that's like God painting with this palette of many, many different colors, and he has this beautiful picture in mind. It involves all these differences and variances. And, um, and so I think what, as Christ exposes these areas, he's, he's confronting us with the fallen part of us, the part of us that's destructive and toxic. And he's showing himself as the provision. He's come to live in our place. He's come to live with perfect love for his father and for everyone else. And then he dies. He takes upon himself the, the penalty of our sin. He absorbs all of God's wrath for us. There's no condemnation for us. So he, he takes care of all that. And I think we're, we're actually can be most productive and most fruitful when we are operating from that t sort of identity, from that kind of status rather than for it. You know, I, I think I'm, I, I think my wife would say in those all too brief moments when I'm resting in who God's made me to be and what he's given me and the kind of ministry he's given me, like probably more pleasant person to be around than when I'm try in self-proving mode. Um, yeah, David. And Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us does liberate us with his generosity, other things to, to view I'll say this, to look at other people. When, you, when you're in pharisaical, self-proving mode, you can't even see other people unless they are a stepping stone to get to what you want. Maybe you see them in that sense, but you don't see their hurts, their needs. Remember the Pharisees? I mean, they constantly were fighting with Jesus because he was healing on the Sabbath day and he was feeding his disciples on the Sabbath day. And they didn't care about the hunger of the disciples or the misery of the sick people. They cared about the standard. That's what they were going after, and misery loves company. Hey, if I'm doing it, you need to be doing it too. And Jesus comes, and he kind of turns all that around. And as we finally start to see who he is, how good he's been to us, the, the goodness of, of God in, in, in every area of our lives, um, it can liberate us from the misery of that self-absorption and that performance view of things and can actually enable us to see the hurts, the, the needs, the struggles of, of people around us. Um, and so I, in keeping with, and again, lest you think, well, okay, does, do, do we just as a church not care at all about obedience then? Well, look at, um, back up to chapter 22. We'll, we'll end with this, where it says, there's this lawyer, who, who, who knows, not an attorney, but a lawyer in those days was someone who studied the law of Moses deeply and very intently and carefully, and, and this person came to question Jesus about, hey, what's the greatest commandment? And in verse 37, Jesus answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is this great and foremost commandment. The second's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. I mean, this is, I think, uh, what my friend back there said earlier about missing the point. Like, we, we become so religious and so dedicated and so active, we miss the point. Well, they had missed the point. Jesus says, here's the point. Love God, love other people. That's the point. Well, as a church body, that's what we want more of here is, is love for God, love for other people. And we're becoming increasingly convinced that where that comes from is, that comes from this understanding of how God has loved us. That's what this says in 1 John. We love because he first loved us, right? So we keep looking at that over and over and over and over again in a setting like this or in a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, meeting over coffee somewhere or in a phone conversation or in a text interchange there's all these opportunities to keep reminding each other of what is true, how we've been loved, how we've been provided for. And we all need that. We all need that. And we need, we need that to come through the channel of people who know us, not just, that's where, again, it's, it's, it's a tragic thing that 
hey, the internet and technology is a great advancement in many ways, made our lives easier in a lot of ways, but it's also made our lives a whole lot harder in some ways. I think we'd all admit that, right? Um, look, you, you, don't even, you don't have to get out of bed in the morning to come to church. Just grab your tablet. You can find guys that are 100 times better communicators than me and Don. You could find and, and just, just watch it in bed, the coziness of your own bed. You don't have to come here. So why do we do, what is this? Well, look, there's more than just hearing a talking head. <laughs> Jesus came and got close to people. He knew people deeply. He knew them perfectly. He conveyed truth to them from one soul to another. So there's more than just our fast food society offers us in terms of church. And we are wanting that. I want more of that for me. I want more of it for you. God has been teaching us and guiding us and providing for us as a church, and I'm looking forward to how he's going to continue to do that. Uh, now I'm rambling. So any last uh, thoughts or questions? Anything at all? Spencer says, good talk. Thank you. Spencer enjoyed it. Um, all right, well, let's, um, let's pray. God, thank you for the time we had this morning and what you've uh, communicated to us through your word in Matthew 23 and in so many other places as well. Lord, we, we have it so good and, and we so often don't see it. Oh my goodness, I, God, I don't know what to say exactly other than I, I'm sorry for how I don't see how good you've been to me, the gifts you've given me so many areas of my life and most importantly just the way you've assured me that i'm forgiven because of what jesus did and i'm your son i'm adopted by you and you're never going to kick me out of the family that you are blessing me with every blessing in the spiritual realm and heavenly places everything in christ is mine and i deserve none of that what I want for myself, I want for the people in here this morning, uh, greater freedom, the ability to be who you made us to be from a place of approval and acceptance in you and not for it, from, from a position of satisfaction that's given as a gift instead of trying to gain it for ourselves. We've got to pray as we go into the Christmas season the next few weeks that you would fill our lives with reminders of the incarnation of Jesus. Help us to see how amazing it is that you came down here through your son and lived in this, this dirty, God-forsaken, broken, angry, anxious, fearful, greedy place. Make that more real to us, God. Let the, the narrative of your plan to create this world and to redeem this world, let that become more and more real to us. Thank you for everyone in here this morning. Thank you for the, the friendships and the fellowship that we enjoy that you have cultivated here. Pray that, that, that we would have our eyes open to how you're doing that, that we would more fully and readily embrace that. Pray if there are people in here this morning who are visiting but don't really have a church home or don't have a fellowship to connect with, I pray that you would provide that for them, whether that's here or elsewhere, but that they would also come to know you through relationships and through uh, intimacy and, and that you would work that into their lives. So thank you, God, for taking care of everything for us. Most of all, thank you for providing for our greatest need, the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life, a relationship with you forever. We love you, God, because you first loved us desire to, to serve you and serve other people because of how you served us. So make that a reality. And as you do, you as our only leader, as our only rabbi, as our only teacher, you will get all the praise in the end. In Jesus' name.